Hey guys, before we get started, thank you so much for 90,000 subscribers. It means a lot. Now, we're getting so close to 100,000 subs, so it would mean a lot to me if you could go down and hit that subscribe button. Now, on to the video. This is the story of UPS Flight 1307. On the 7th of February 2006, a UPS DC-8 was on day two of a five-day eight-leg trip across the United States. This particular leg was from Atlanta to Philadelphia International Airport. At 11.34 p.m. that night, the DC-8 was descending through 31,000 feet with the first officer in charge. The flight was routine, and so far, everything was boring. That was about to change. The first officer smelled something. To him, it smelled like wood burning. The flight engineer backed up the first officer. He too thought that he smelled something for a few seconds there. But as the minutes ticked on, the odor grew stronger. The burning smell was more pronounced at the back. The captain had to make a choice. He could either divert or continue on to Philadelphia. He scanned his instruments. None of them showed any indication of a fire. The flight engineer had not seen any smoke anywhere. And on top of that, all of these pilots were used to unusual smells. Sometimes they'd fly over forest fires or they'd fly unusual cargo. So they brushed this off, since the odor did not smell electrical. But they kept trying to identify the source of the smell nonetheless. The flight engineer checked the bleed air switches and the air conditioning system to see if those were the source of the smell. As he did that, flight 1307 was descending through 18,000 feet. The captain and the first officer started the approach checklist. They were cleared down to 6,000 feet, but as they descended, the captain grew more concerned and he asked, can you smell it back there? The flight engineer went back into the main cargo compartment just to double check. The smell was much stronger over there, but there was no smoke, no haze, nothing to indicate that they had a fire on board. Over the next 10 minutes, they continued to troubleshoot the problem as the plane made its way to Philadelphia. At 11.54 p.m., when the plane was at 3,600 feet, the crew's worst fears were confirmed. The flight engineer said, we've got cargo smoke. Flight 1307 was burning up. They were quite close to Philadelphia International. In fact, the approach controller had just cleared their visual approach onto runway 27 right and handed them off to the tower. The captain contacted the tower, who cleared them in to land, after which the captain told them of their situation and he requested emergency vehicles to meet them on the runway. The flight engineer stated that they had a fire in Section C. They put on their oxygen masks, and the flight engineer started on the lower and or main cargo compartment smoke or fire checklist. Now that the controller knew that they had an emergency, he cleared the crew to land on runway 27 left. It was the designated runway for emergencies at Philadelphia, but the captain doesn't acknowledge the runway change. The flight engineer now had to go back to an access panel and closed the cargo air shutoff valve. As he opened the access panel, black smoke billowed out from the panel. Somewhere deep in the plane, a fire was burning. As the plane descended, the tower controller checked in with the crew. Just confirmed, you are lined up for the left side. It appears that you are lined up for the right, end quote. The captain had forgotten to tell the first officer about the runway change, but the controller was very understanding. He said, you are clear to land on the right, we'll just tell fire. At 11.59 p.m., the plane touched down on runway 27 right, and as soon as the plane came to a stop, the captain ordered everyone to evacuate. A few minutes after they were clear of the plane, the DC-8 went up in flames. All three pilots were shaken, but alive. The first question that you might have is, why didn't they land at the first sign of trouble? Well, at the start of the crisis, the only indication was an odor or a smell. The manuals and checklists don't tell you what to do if only odors are present. Keep in mind, the fire warning did not come on till later on in the flight. The investigators also vindicated the decision of the crew to land at Philadelphia. When they first detected the odor, they had quite a few airports nearby, from Washington Dulles to Andrews Air Force Base to Baltimore, and diverting would have put them on the ground a few minutes sooner. But for all those positives, there's one big downside. 
it would increase the workload in the cockpit immensely. If they were to divert, all the additional work would not have allowed them to focus on the task at hand, that is, monitoring the fire and carrying out the checklist. Continuing on to Philadelphia was the right thing to do. But the crew found themselves in a strange situation. They didn't know what to do, and it's not their fault. There wasn't a checklist for the situation that they were in. Boeing and UPS had four checklists to deal with an in-flight fire. Three of those checklists were predicated on visible evidence of smoke or fire. There wasn't a checklist that went, do this if you smell something burning. But the way they became aware of the fire can tell us a lot about the fire itself. At first, they could smell something burning. So the investigators think that something was smoldering inside a cargo container, which did not produce a lot of smoke. Once the fire burned through the container, it spread fast. The pilots were getting fire warnings near section 33, and the captain's displays began to fail. All of this happened within minutes. Just to put into perspective how fast the fire spread, the flight engineer noted that smoke was entering the cockpit when the plane touched down. By the time the pilots were ready to evacuate, they couldn't even see each other. That brings us to the million dollar question. Where and how did the fire start? They eliminated section 33 as a culprit for the source because the warnings there were triggered by smoke seeping in from the main chamber above. Containers 1 to 11 were also eliminated as they were relatively undamaged. Containers 15 and 18 were eliminated because they were able to verify the contents of the containers and nothing flammable was in them. Containers 16 and 17 were eliminated as well. The fire started near containers 12 to 14. That's where firefighters saw flames when they entered the plane. They looked at the wiring in this part of the plane to see if a short circuit could have started a fire. They found no evidence for that. Unfortunately, they weren't able to accurately pinpoint the source of the fire in those containers. The containers did contain laptops and other gadgets with lithium-ion batteries. They studied all the batteries that exhibited any kind of damage, but they were unable to find a cell that they could unequivocally say started the fire. Also, the investigators were unable to identify everything that was in the containers. Here's a quote. The safety board concludes that the exact origin and cause of the in-flight fire on board the airplane could not be determined due to the destruction of potentially helpful evidence. However, the available evidence suggests that the fire most likely originated in container 12, 13, or 14." End quote. But the prevalent theory is that a lithium-ion battery started the fire. We don't know what exactly started the fire, but that doesn't mean that we did not learn anything from this accident. This accident showed that there was a fault with the way the smoke detectors were set up in the DC-8. These smoke detectors didn't go off until 20 minutes after the fire had started. This was due to the fact that during the certification tests for the smoke detection system, cargo was not loaded on the plane. So they didn't test the system to see the system could detect smoke in a plane fully loaded with cargo. The tests never accounted for the effects of a loaded cargo area on smoke detection. The investigators found that the fire detection certification tests did not account for all operating conditions. The testing methodology never mentioned whether or not cargo containers were to be used in the fire system certification tests. This is important because if you have a fire inside a container, then the smoke detection system might not, well, detect the fire because the smoke is contained to an extent. This is not a problem with the DC-8 alone. The investigators found that the certification methodology used to validate the fire and smoke detection systems on multiple airplanes were lacking. They too failed to account for the effects a cargo container would have on smoke progression. The last thing is that these pilots did not have a fire suppression system to fight a fire. After ValueJet 592, the FAA mandated fire suppression systems in cargo compartments on board passenger aircraft, but that mandate never made it to cargo airplanes. But at the end of the day, the crew of Flight 1307 was very lucky. History is littered with planes that didn't make it back due to in-flight fires. From ValueJet 592, Swiss Air 111, Mohawk Airlines Flight 40, and Nigeria Airways Flight 2120, just to name a few. Once a fire takes root, it's very hard to deal with it. 
It's just a matter of time before the fire overwhelms you or your plane. To see how bad this could have been, look no further than UPS Flight 6. They had an in-flight fire just 100 miles from the airport. The 747 went down just before reaching Dubai. That could have been the fate of Flight 1307 if there were any delays whatsoever or if they had to fly a few extra minutes to reach an airport. I guess the takeaway is that where there's no smoke, there still might be a fire. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll talk to you guys next time. Stay safe.